I believe every person has a right to basic knowledge of how to optimize their mind, body, and spirit. Here, I bring to you influential individuals and ideas to help you live a more healthy, fulfilling life. I'm Julie Fouché, and I'd like to welcome you to Pursuing Health. Welcome to episode 13, part two of Pursuing Health. I've had a lot of requests for an episode about nutrition over the past few months, so I'm excited to bring you this new two-part episode with Umaro Kadagan. I first connected with Umaro through one of my sponsors, Pure Pharma, in the fall of 2014, and I've been really impressed with his multi-angle approach to nutrition. He lives in Denmark, and he's an adjunct professor of nutrition and functional medicine at the University of Western States. There, he works directly with individuals and groups, including professional athletes and military groups, as a nutritional therapist, and he's also a well-known author, chef, and lecturer on the topics of nutrition and functional medicine in Denmark and across the world. I sat down with Umaro at the 2015 CrossFit Games, and in part one of this episode, he discussed his story and his general approach to nutrition. Here, in part two, we'll talk more specifically about his nutrition advice for athletes, as well as for supporting the body while recovering from injury. As always, please remember to subscribe and rate Pursuing Health on iTunes, and share your feedback using hashtag JFHealth on social media. So with that, let's get started with the second part of episode 13 with Umaro Kadagan. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about athletes specifically. Yeah. So we talked about um, just general advice for mm-hmm. the general population, making sure you have all those big stones in place, yeah. like the sleep, the nutrition, yeah. the exercise, stress, um, some supplements that you might yeah. start taking. But if you're really trying to dial it in because you're a high-level athlete, yeah. what are some of the additional things that you might start to look at? Well, for high-level athletes, you definitely want to uh, – Make sure you don't become carbophobic. Okay. I see, you know, you see a lot of people who do very well by reducing their carbohydrates when they're sedentary. They have lots of belly fat, intra-abdominal fat, mm-hmm. low lean mass, and they don't, they don't. I mean, their f- metabolism is quite low, slow, mm-hmm. and so they do well on a sort of vegetables and lean meat, fish only diet until they lose weight and they get in better shape. But mm-hmm. once you start moving more, I see a lot of elite athletes who actually are underperforming or who can't recover properly because they think I must be on a strict paleolithic diet or I must be on a ke- you know ketogenic diet and if you l- I mean once you need to generate lots of energy really quickly there's no way around glucose you s- even if you're right. keto adapted fat's just too slow to do anything high intensity um, it might work well if you have to run like a triple marathon wow. where it's not speed but it's just being able to go steadily and having an energy source that you can access constantly because you won't be able to load enough carbohydrates into your system but mm-hmm. you know, when you have crossfit you have weightlifting you have football soccer all these things you definitely want to get make sure you're not carb phobic that mm-hmm. it's not an excuse for eating skittles all day long uh, drinking lots of soft drinks but make sure you have potatoes rice right. chickpeas lentils all these legumes these foods that contain starch that's great advice. So, so it's very simple, but for a lot of athletes, it's like, whoa, this works really well. Yeah. Right. Duh. So you have to start paying more attention to it. Exactly. I think that is great advice. And I've heard that from a number of CrossFitters who started out with eating almost entirely protein and fat and yeah. then realized maybe I'll add in some more brown rice or white yeah. rice or oatmeal, yeah. some other sources of carbohydrates, and they started feeling a lot better. Yeah. And I see, and also I see with people who do CrossFit, when initially they start, you know, people and they're out of shape, mm-hmm. they do rel- with well with the low carb, high plant, right. high protein, uh, say be- rather than the high fat, do a moderate fat mm-hmm. diet. But as I said, once you get into when once you start getting close to peak performance, mm-hmm. fat and proteins are going to be too slow an energy source, even if you have really good metabolism. So mm-hmm. you also see the shift people as they get ripped and they get really strong and explosive they need to start adding more carbohydrates um, or they either won't be just won't be able to perform or they won't be able to recover. And do you recommend that they eat those only post-workout or spread throughout the day? 
I, th I mean, first, I think first we should just be very, you know, have see what works best. Some people find mm -hmm. it best to have them post workout. Some people find it better to have them pre workout. Some people do better having them spread out through the day. So, okay. what works best for you? You know, there's the research is not that clear. Some people say, oh, I have them post workout. It works wonders. Well, if it works wonders for you, good, do that. Keep doing and it. other people say, but I feel much better if I have them spread out through the day. Do right. that. So. You know, people. We know people are different genetically, physiologically. Right. So it would make sense. You can't do this one size fits all. Um, but certainly, I'd say make sure you get some carbohydrates post workout and sometimes also pre workout. I mean, also, mm -hmm. my, I'm. If people have followed my Instagram. <laughs> I post quite a few pictures with bananas, and <laughs> yes, that's because I've seen them. I'm on this rampage so that people do all these super advanced pre and intra and post workout right. things, and usually they don't need them. Th there might be special instances, or right. if you do seven workouts a week, you do multiple training sessions a day. Yes, but for the average person who works out four or five times a week, you know, they buy all these things. It's mm -hmm. like you just need to eat some carbohydrates in the meal before and then have a banana to replenish your stores. You're fine. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. Un I if it needs to be complex, do it. But if not, don't waste your time on it. That's yeah. great so advice. Yeah, so certainly that for athletes. And then, of course, also the other thing for elite athletes, I'd say, is... Um, you know, making sure that you get enough omega-3 fatty acids because I meet so many elite athletes who are constantly dealing with inflammation. Mm -hmm. And inflammation is going to be part of the game when you push yourself hard. That wear and tear, right. there's no way to avoid inflammation. So it's not a matter of shutting down inflammation, but managing it. And omega-3 fatty acids, vitamin D as well is really important. And also getting enough vegetables. So I actually meet quite a few endurance athletes who say, well, vegetables are too bulky, so I'll eat white rice, I'll mm -hmm. have all these soft drinks, I'll have all these refined carbohydrates because I don't, you know, I have to eat enough calories. Right. And so vegetables are sort of... You're missing some micronutrients. They're missing, yeah, they're missing there. micronutrients. And so they're constantly suffering from inflammation or they can't recover properly. And then when we say start adding in lots of mm -hmm. vegetables, berries and fruits, sometimes we might have to do a lot of that as juice because they simply don't have enough gastric volume to eat them on top of getting enough okay. calories and enough pro or enough carbohydrates and mm -hmm. protein once they do that you give the body the tools to manage inflammation so you want a bit of inflammation post-workout that's actually what's going to facilitate repair but also going to facilitate a lot of your adaptations to training so you get stronger you get better you know better endurance your muscles grow mm -hmm. that needs just a bit of inflammation to kick off that process so if you suppress it completely medically uh, mm -hmm. then you have a problem you might avoid a bit of pain but you actually also take away, whittle away at the training response you'll get, or even healing. We can s there are mm -hmm. studies emerging, long-term use of anti-inflammatories right. might save you a bit of pain, but the healing process is slowed down, so whatever tissue damage you have, it'll take you a lot longer to recover from. Right. Um, so, so again, eat your vegetables. Eat vegetables. <laughs> and then yeah, and and ha have Eat vegetables, have health healthy, uh, you know, healthy fats, right. that works, and vitamin D as well because that's also important for regulating inflammation. And then also so you know, probiotics, because mm -hmm. if you push yourself really hard, we know that both mental and physiological stress will actually decimate your gut flora. Yes. So getting probiotics, um, I mean, there's a lot of r research out of Russia on mm -hmm. that, and then it's been sort of discounted, you know, in the West, yeah, okay, Russians, crazy people, blah, blah, <laughs> blah. Uh, we, we don't, uh, you know, also out of Japan, but okay. it's there and it's really high quality. And they, uh, they, I mean, it's been looked at for athletes and saying, well, they do better mm -hmm. because they have better control of inflammation. They have better nutrient uptake. They have better recovery. Their immune system is stronger. So they won't all of a sudden be out with a cold and then they can't train for two weeks and then they get behind with the plan and so right, forth. Right. So that as well, as well, I think is important and then i mean like with sports nutrition supplements there are a few basic things that work really well so creatine works really well for strength uh muscle growth and explosive power mm -hmm. and it's very well tested and it's not just for weightlifters or sprinters like for crossfit right you get lots of <laughs> things with out of creatine of explosive, yeah, yeah exactly movement. you get that and even i said for endurance athletes sometimes they find okay i actually get a bit of sprint power so if you can sprint at the end of a marathon okay. That's important. And without adding too much weight, I know I've experimented with just smaller doses yeah. spread throughout the day yeah. and not necessarily using a loading phase. Yeah. And when you do that, you don't actually gain much body weight, no. um, but you still get some of the benefits. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, so that certainly is a, a good old classic. Mm -hmm. Beta alanine is also quite interesting. Okay. It get, gives you this buffer. So when you're doing high intensity work, you can go for longer. Um, okay. So, I mean, the best studies are in 800 meter runners and they, they will take three, four seconds off their time. Wow. And it's in the second half of the race. So mm -hmm. they run as, it's not that they run faster initially, but after 400 meters, no matter how fit you are, you'll slow down because you accumulate lactic acid and so forth. And if you can sort of offset that mm 
-hmm. just a bit, then you can keep on going for longer before fatigue sets in or before lactic mm -hmm. acidosis slows you down. So three, four seconds is quite significant for a, you know, an 800 Absolutely. meter run. So that's also, uh, and especially if you're looking huge. at CrossFit, I mean, where you get all these things where you accumulate lactic acid and you get into fatigue. So that's basi basic. And then I say it's not a supplement, but food, but beetroot juice. I mean, oh look yeah. at the research on that. It's so, <laughs> it, it, and I like <laughs> it because it's, compelling. It's, it's, it's compelling and it's food, uh, mm -hmm. which I really like. But, you know, the studies half a liter of beetroot juice a day, just one week, and you get two to eight percent improved oxygen uptake and utilization. That's quite significant. Yeah. Or also from the same um, group, they did. Uh, time to exhaustion at <laughs> max intensity so you can oh people wow. you put them on a treadmill mm -hmm. or a, a concept two rower or a spinning mm -hmm. bike and you have them go right at their anaerobic threshold right under that mm -hmm. and they have to stay there which is pretty painful <laughs> and then if you give them beetroot juice half a liter a day for one week before they can go for an additional 90 seconds before they have to tap out wow that's you know, that's a lot one half 90 minutes seconds. Yeah. yeah um so i mean think of crossfit or any any type of sport you know i say mm -hmm. that's significant so that also Wow. As, you know, so they're simple, but they're really effective. Caffeine mm. can be good, but you have to be careful with how often you use it. So it actually works, but only on people who are caffeine naive. So if right. you drink coffee all the time, have Red Bull, whatever, it's mm -hmm. not going to work. But if, you have, if you're well rested, well fed, <laughs> good <laughs> shape, not stressed, then a bit of caffeine can make you perform above, okay. um, you uh, uh, above what you do otherwise. So there are studies that are quite compelling, but they're all done on like 25, 22, 20 to 25 year old student, students who do, you know, who are like uh, athlete on athlete scholarships. They haven't had any caffeine for the week leading up to the study. Okay. They're well rested, well fed and well nourished, not stressed, mm -hmm. had enough sleep. And then you give them a couple right. of cups of coffee or some caffeinated soft drink and they perform better. But that's just Th that's not that not many most of the population. Exactly, <laughs> right. yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, and caffeine still might, if you're really tired, it might mm -hmm. change uh, change your perception of the fatigue. It doesn't really give you energy. It just makes you not feel the fatigue, which, mm -hmm. you know, like if you were at games, and so you might use that to get through a workout. Right. But when you do it that way, it comes at a price because you're pushing beyond physiological barriers where your body would normally stop you. Mm. And the question is, if you do, you know, if you do that all the time, what price do you pay? Right. Maybe... You know, it's like the interest rate on that energy loan is going to be quite steep. Right, right. You might not want to go there. No. Wow. Okay. So that's some great advice for athletes specifically yeah. with adding more carbohydrates and then continuing the same vitamin D, fish oil, yeah. probiotics, but also um, you talked about creatine, beta alanine, beetroot, beetroot juice, juice yeah. and possibly caffeine, caffeine as long as you're not yeah. already very sensitive to yeah, it. Yeah, that. And then I'll also say magnesium, though it's okay. not... Probably it's not a performance enhancer, but I just see a lot of top-level athletes who are low on magnesium mm -hmm. because you know, just if you sweat, you lose magnesium as well, and so you lose a lot of magnesium through sweat. And magnesium certainly for cramping, but also right. for energy production. Magnesium is actually really important, and for sleep mm -hmm. and regulating the stress response. So when you're doing something like CrossFit, you want your adrenals to go all out when you're doing your workout right. or in competition, but then you want them to calm down afterwards. You know, then right. you get the best of both worlds. The sort of immediate in performance enhancing effects of stress hormones, but you want mm -hmm. to shut that down afterwards or, th or you will get into trouble, then they'll start doing damage to your body. So magnesium will help do that. So will omega-3 fatty acids. And that, you know, actually also good old vitamin C is really yeah, interesting. Yeah. Um, so I've seen a few athletes so far. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking they should have had vitamin C before and especially after workout, some of the athletes who basically tapped out during the MRF. Okay, right. I would say if, if if I were their nutrition <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> performance coach, then I would put them on vitamin C after an episode like that because okay. you can see that vitamin C enhances recovery after severe physiological stress. Wow, that's great advice. Well, I hope some of those girls are getting vitamin C right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. And that's actually a great segue because I want to talk a little bit more about nutrition for recovery. Yeah. So we talked after I ruptured my Achilles and yeah. had surgery, and you gave me some great tips. Yeah. Um, to try to speed my recovery and vitamin C was one of those yeah. because it's obviously going to help with tendon repair. Yeah. Um, but can you talk a little bit more about your approach to recovery? Yeah. Well, for, from an injury. Just from yeah. an, and in, in, in yeah. general, some sort of musculoskeletal injury. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. So for, again, for recovery, we want to make sure that we manage inflammation, not suppress it. Okay. Also, we don't want it out of control because then it's like a bonfire out of control. Right. So you just keep on doing damage. But if possible, you want to avoid long-term use of anti-inflammatories. You can use them immediately to take mm -hmm. some of the immediate pain, but 
otherwise they might actually interfere with healing. So you want to make sure that you have the nutrients necessary for healing and mm -hmm. vitamin C becomes really crucial here because vitamin C is so important in the formation of new collagen. So vitamin C helps you make strong but supple collagen. So almost think like you have cables of steel that are mm -hmm. highly flexible. That's what you want your collagen to be like you know, with your tendons and ligaments. Right. So vitamin C is important for that. And vitamin C helps regulate inflammation as well. And then actually hydrolyzed collagen makes okay. sense. There's not a lot of research, but there's some research um, because you use it for making tendons, ligaments, right. and also cartilage. A lot of people like, you know, like if they turn a killer tendon, full or partial rupture, they'll think, well, glucosamine must be good because it helps with osteoarthritis of mm -hmm. the knee. But glucosamine only seems to work for elbows and knees specifically, okay. not when you're, and that's for the cartilage and right, the joint. But right. when you've torn a tendon, it's uh, the physiology is a bit different. So what seems to best bet would actually be to do hydrolyzed collagen mm -hmm. to make sure you have enough building blocks to rebuild those tendons really fast mm -hmm. uh, or as fast as possible. Uh, or you can do bone broth. There seems to be some right. collagen released into that as well. Which I've been doing a lot uh. of that and I've actually come to like it. It's yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like that cup of tea or cup of coffee uh, if yeah, you yeah. just drink it by itself. Uh, yeah, and I mean, it's it's like the world's oldest comfort food. Right. And, I mean, and, uh, and uh, you have studies on chicken soup helping with yeah. like upper uh, airway respiratory infections so it does a lot of good mm -hmm. when you yeah so so vitamin c and and some collagen makes a lot of sense and those basics with vitamin d and omega-3 fatty acids we also right. know zinc is important for recovery but again if you do a multivitamin mm -hmm. or like zma zinc magnesium uh, right. mixture might as well that's really important for recovery and uh, those are very basic things. And then if you have a problem regulating inflammation, you can also try some of the herbal anti-inflammatories like okay. curcumin from turmeric, mm -hmm. ginger, um, boswellia. Mm -hmm. um, what else you have? Actually, rose hips, uh, rose hip extract. There's okay. some good research on that as well. For because a lot of these botanicals, if you take them at low to medium doses, they will not completely suppress inflammation, but they will take the top off so to speak and mm -hmm. so you still get enough basal inflammation to facilitate healing right. and repair so I, I think that's important and then although I work mostly with nutrition there are also some you know there's in terms of rehabilitation the proper kind of training is really important mm -hmm. and what you want to do to make tendons and ligaments regrow is you want to do l long slow sustained controlled loading mm -hmm. they respond completely differently from muscles so you want to do strength training, but not for your muscular strength, uh, neither explosive or for like slow grinding, right. but what will make your structural strength uh, increase. And that's where you have to slow the tempo down. So you can, like if you do, you know, if you have a firm Achilles tendon mm -hmm. tear, when you get to the point where you can start doing some calf races or just move your ankle, mm -hmm. you want to do a tempo four, two, four, two. So you're going to go for extension or contraction in mm -hmm. four seconds hold it for two seconds and then reverse the movement four seconds but it has four to seconds. be completely slow and controlled no acceleration no deceleration no plyometric loading right and there are studies out of copenhagen university f with a uh, professor henning langbeer with for people who needed to do ha had partial or full reconstruction of their knee or achilles tendon or had you know shoulder problems like tear of um, some of the ligaments or muscles and when they do that protocol with the slow controlled mm -hmm. strength training either two sets per d or two you know, training sessions per day with body weight or three times a week with barbells or dumbbells mm -hmm. um, or some sort of external loading right. within 12 months they could usually increase the thickness of ligaments and tendons by about 50 percent wow. and also increase flexibility so mm -hmm. they're thicker they're stronger but more flexible okay but only if people weren't on anti-inflammatories all the time right. so then when they did those studies and they had a group of people who were on anti-inflammatories not just or painkillers not just once in a while but constantly mm -hmm. the training seemed not to work okay. so yeah so that's really slow training and you want to do the full range of motion because you want to make sure the new collagen and the new mm -hmm. tissue you're creating that it's you immediately get it into <laughs> it, it sh shape so you want to you can actually mold right. to connect connected tissue when it regrows by doing controlled loading um, so make sure that you the re you know, mm -hmm. healing Achilles tendons it gets flexible like it's long enough and also gets strong enough but of course you don't want to start loading it too early but right. the moment you can do that then um, you start working on it you can start working on it and mm -hmm. also I say you know for CrossFit I'd say probably the most common injury I mm -hmm. see is that people quickly get to a point where their, st their stamina and their strength lets them exert a sort of 
loading that they cannot sustain structurally. So they don't. Mm. They have the physical strength and stamina to do all these loaded movements, fast movements, mm-hmm. but they do not have the s- they do not have the structural strength. And so you need to okay. train that. And of course, if you get an injury, but I'd like to see more prehab with mm. that. So people spending time very slowly, moving s- slowly, even though it's like, but I want to do these things really right, fast and right. explosively. But you need to slow down initially, so you actually build a sort of structural strength, structural strength mm-hmm. base that enables you to handle that loading later on. I do some work with the Danish Royal Lifeguards, not as lifeguards on the beach, but you know the elite regiment that protects the Queen uh, oh and the royal family. So I know their f- uh, form their physical trainer really well, and f- mm. I spar with him okay. um, about nutrition and health. And they introduced CrossFit as because they needed a, a highly effective way to get mm-hmm. both the initial cat uh, recruits into shape, also to stay in shape, also because uh, he, he works not just with the lifeguards but also the Danish equivalent of the Navy SEALs and Green Berets and so forth, okay. and find something they could do when they were you know stationed in Afghanistan or Iraq and other hot spots. Mm-hmm. And so they found CrossFit's really effective because you get all these multiple domains of fitness right. and you can do it with simple equipment and the time invested is not that long and you still stay rather fit. But initially they had a lot of injuries with the new recruits. So they, they said, okay, for the first six months, we're not going for any personal records. We want you to be mm-hmm. move it, do progress very slowly. We'll do lots of technique and we'll do lots of build a structural strength foundation and then we'll let you loose. Then you can go there compete go. against yeah. each other and go for AMRAPs on time and, you know, each minute on the minute workout where you push right. hard. And once they had that initial half year basal t- basic training, mm-hmm. so to speak, all of a sudden right. they didn't have the injuries later on because they built a structural strength base that enabled them to handle the loading they subjected themselves that's to afterwards yeah that's huge i think and and six months too people yeah. become so impatient and they say okay i'll do a month of my on ramp and then i'm good to go but yeah. i think that you know crossfit's charter of mechanics mechanics consistency and then intensity yeah. it's so important and it can take that long yeah. six months you just need to be patient and build your capacity there so you can handle the intensity exactly. so yeah. that's a great and that's I mean great to know and i mean and anything right like half a year if you, you know you're in your 20s or 30s or even 40s mm-hmm. you haven't exercised for a while taking half a year to get the foundation in place i mean in the grand in terms scheme of, of yeah, things it's, grand it's, scheme of things, it's but a second right. and and you'll be so grateful later on because <laughs> the, the, the price you pay uh, i mean it right. can be pretty severe um, yeah. so uh, yeah i think that and, and i think I mean, uh, not just of crossfit but a lot of elite athletes they have to think longer term mm-hmm. and build a base. I One of my really good friends is Peter Gell, who used to be one of the world's best badminton players. And oh he's wow. now been hired as the um, national team coach for France. And he's okay. also done worked with the Danish national team. What's interesting with Denmark and badminton is when we look at our junior players and our under 21s, they're good, but they never win world championships, the Olympics or European championships because they say we'll spend that time building a base, but then they peak after 21 uh-huh. and they can compete with the Chinese and the Koreans and the Indonesians who also have long proud mm-hmm. traditions within badminton and they say we'll sacrifice that top right. end performance f- during your junior years and under 21s because then you peak and you have the foundation here of course we're talking more about skill and mm-hmm. s- being able to strategic thinking right. but it means that in the long run they do so much better pays off. even yeah. though they might not get these immediate well they get benefits immediate mm-hmm. but then like get these <laughs> super results immediately but in the long term pays off yeah. yeah that's a great lesson for life in general Ex- right yeah. most yeah. of the, <laughs> the best things come when you put the time in or make those sacrifices exactly. ahead of time yeah. and then they will pay off in the exactly. end so yeah. that's great advice and um i love i love everything that you were talking about with athletes and with rehab um and also how you emphasize the fact that you need those few things in place first yeah. so yeah. regardless of whether you're doing CrossFit, whether you're an elite athlete, whether you're rehabbing, having an injury, you can never underestimate just solid nutrition, sleep, yeah. stress, um, you know, doing your, your yeah. exercise and yeah. building that foundation first. Yeah. So that's huge. And, yeah. and I love that we can talk about all these details, but it's great for people to know you need to address those big things yeah, first. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, there's the like 80, the 20, 80 print principle, 20% mm-hmm. of what you do will get you 80% of the results. So those 20% <laughs> that's sound sleep, proper nutrition, not making it more advanced than what you can handle. So right. it works in everyday life, stress reduction, that will get you 80% of the way. Then if you want to be super elite, you can do a whole lot more, but 
if you're still omitting what gets you 80% of the results, why would you bother with the rest? Right. Whether you want to be the world's best or your national, you know, champion, or you just want to have fun mm -hmm. with your body and be healthy. Right. Well, I want to end with three questions that I ask everyone. Mm -hmm. So um, hopefully this will be easy for you. Yep. But we're going to we're gonna go first with the three things that you do on a regular basis that you think have the biggest positive impact on your health. Yeah. Well, for me, it's certainly movement. So I okay. exercise every day. Mm -hmm. um, and I always scale exercise to what I feel like on the day. I like to push myself, but I'm now at <laughs> the age of uh, 38. I'm <laughs> clever enough to understand if... Today I have a really hard workout planned and I don't feel like it, you know, or I can feel it's too much. Right. I'll downscale it. So, so I make sure that I move and exercise more or less every day. Mm -hmm. I do that, and then the vegetable thing. I just make sure I get my mm -hmm. vegetables every day. Uh, so, find whatever way to do it. Mm -hmm. have make juices, buy vegetable juices, eat lots of vegetables. When mm -hmm. I travel, I always bring like greens powder with me, and I get okay. also bring freeze dried beetroot powder so I can. If everything else Every fails, day. I can at least put it in a shaker and get that. And then, I mean, vegetables, and then I also make sure I get my protein in place because that helps keep me satiated and right. so forth. So, yeah, so those are two two big things. And then for me also, supplementation is important because I have, I mean, whether I'm cured from those diseases or have them under control, that can be debated from now and forever. Right. So, but there are just certain things I know I need to have lots of omega-3 fatty acids, vitamin D, probiotics and I also need to take a few more esoteric things for energy production because I had that chronic fatigue mm -hmm. syndrome um, and if I don't take them I can feel within half a week to a week that things start going downhill again mm -hmm. so for me those are extremely important um, if okay. I don't do them I know I suffer immediately and then sleep is in there as well um, although with my traveling I don't always <laughs> get my eight hours that I right, should um, right. but if and then if you had that if I weren't <laughs> On top of those other things, that would really decimate me. But I can get away with less yeah. when I really have to. Okay. How about one thing that you think would help a lot, but maybe this is sleep for you, but that you don't always do or you can't really, you haven't been able to implement it into your life yet? Sleep in, in, during certain periods mm -hmm. is definitely one that mm -hmm. cause I can feel the difference as well. I can still perform quite well when I'm not quite getting eight hours, but when I get my eight hours, that's... When you're at your yeah. best. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then just overall, if you could explain what you think a healthy life looks like to you well i think a healthy life is um, i mean i think a, a great analogy also to get people motivated is to think of what everything you do what you eat but also all the everything you do it's like a dialogue with mm -hmm. your body so you're saying something and you're saying it in a particular tone of voice and you'll get a response so if you eat something i mean essentially there are two ways you can start a conversation hey great to see you fantastic yeah. right and people <laughs> or you can extend your middle finger and say something rather <laughs> rude in which case people will be like oh well wait yeah, a moment i'm you. not going to cooperate <laughs> and so if you think you know for, for your body think of everything you do what you eat the input you give your yeah. body in terms of exercise in terms of how you interact with people what you do mm -hmm. experience it's either like a declaration of love in which case your body becomes very cooperative yeah. or it's you know a middle fi finger extended Right, up, right in, in your face with rather rude words being said <laughs> at the same time. And in that case, your body will respond in kind. Mm -hmm. So, and then You don't want to fight with your body. <laughs> no, exactly. And, and then that's where you'll get disease and discomfort right. and accelerated aging, all those things. So for me, a healthy life or a good life is really about finding out what things can you do, either keep on doing or change. So all the input you give yourself, whether we're thinking at the molecular level, but also, mm -hmm. you know, like what people do you interact with, what relationships do you have, make sure that you get mostly something where you say this is love and might right. once in a while be that you eat something that's not healthy, but I know I'll drink half a bottle of really good wine or champagne because of the enjoyment or right. the company. That's fine. That's still adding to that pool of self-love, so mm -hmm. to speak. Um, and look at where, what areas am I doing things or subjecting myself to things that if I think about it, it's not really a declaration of love and mm -hmm. how can I do something about that? That is wonderful. I've never heard it like that before, but that's a great way to think about health. Yeah. So thank you so much for sitting down with me. Well, thank you. We learned a lot of great things today. Good. So um, that was Umaro, and we will talk to you again later. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for tuning in to this episode. I'd love to hear your feedback, so please leave comments under this post on my website, juliefouché.com. Also, if you like what you hear, subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and give us a rating. 
and share your thoughts on social media. You can use the hashtag JFHealth with any feedback or questions or ideas for future episodes. So thanks again for listening, and we will catch you next time on Pursuing Health. Mm-hmm.